Well, good morning, church. If you would please open your Bibles with me, the book of Philippians this morning, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, as we continue a series called One Thing, Leaning into God's Calling One Thing at a Time. What's the best advice you've ever been given? I mean, all of us are looking for that, that one phrase that perhaps may spark some renewal, some spark some new life. All of us are looking for that sage wisdom that if adhered to could truly make an impact in our lives. So let me ask you then, what is the best advice that you've ever been given? Now, how do I know we're all looking for that? Because did you realize that annually, Google tracks their most searched phrases? And overwhelmingly, year after year after year, the most searched phrase in Google is, what is the best advice you have ever heard? In fact, if you were to search that on Google, you would find 1.49 billion results. Obviously, there are many things that we can adhere to or get our advice from. What's the one thing we need? And so some of these kind of vary from time to time. There's as simple as, you know, just simply, you know, save a portion of your check every time you're given it. Avoid credit card debt. Change your thinking to change your life. Be kind in any situation. Never give up. Never eat vegetables. Never. <laughs> but did you realize the most popular advice given each and every year? You ready for this? Find a mentor and do what they do. I want to, from today, Philippians chapter 3. I want to give you four ways that you can live a life worth following. Four ways that you can be the example that God desires you to be. Paul, up until this point, has given his magnificent obsession of knowing Christ fully and pursuing him with everything he's got. Why? Because Christ is our chief goal and prize. Paul reminds us that Christ is the goal of life and the prize of life. And today, we are going to learn that true fellowship leads to fellowship. That the Christian life is following Christ by becoming like Christ with others. Oh, the joy that we have. Oh, how the world is dying for what we have in Christ. To together follow Christ while becoming like Christ with one another. Oh, the joy of mine to see Christ grow in you. Oh, the joy of mine to see how these hardships and trials and once in a century pandemic, yes, how they've come, but yet how Christ has grown in you. Oh, the blessing that we have to be God's church. To realize that this does matter, that everything we do does count, that we can make an impact, that we can live a life worth following. So what does that look like? Why don't we study in depth, Lee? Philippians chapter 3. Verses 15 through 19. And your Bible says this. For let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you at the appropriate time. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in, in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Let's stop right there. Live a life worth following. I think if there's one summation of Philippians chapter 3 that Paul can give us at this point, it would be the discipline to follow Christ should never outweigh the desire to know Christ. That yes, it will take everything we have in our beings. We are to strive to this perfection, this full maturity in Christ. It will take sacrifice. It will take wisdom. It will take a strenuous effort to be what God declares us to be in Christ. But yet all of that discipline should never outweigh the desire just to know Christ. Just to understand his love 
to feel his mercy and his grace in our lives. And Paul says, you better guard with everything you've got that disposition, that you must remind yourself that the greatest treasure God gives us is Christ, that he is the goal and the prize of all life. Therefore, he says in verse 16, let us hold true to what we have obtained. He figuratively here uses a military term to implore the Philippians to collectively hold on, continue to live out their Christ-filled faith. By how? By Christ-like behavior. He uses a word here, only let us hold true. It means to stand in a row, to walk in a line not to be moved to bring one's life in conformity to the ultimate standard. To Paul, if Christ is appealing, the world is appalling. Christ is not an additive to our lives. His words are not to be flippantly given to us, yet we are to have a posture to obey, a posture to adhere to God's word and to God's way as the infinite will of our lives, to trust him as the pattern of our life. And that is why Paul overwhelmingly says that Christ is our example. In fact, Philippians 2 is based on that sole premise that God has given us an example for us to follow, to live out. Why? Because others are watching us. And as Christ has set the example for us, we are to live a life that follows. We are to live a life worth following. We are only as far along with Christ as we've walked with Christ. That is why we must remind ourselves that Christ's likeness is the purpose of God for the people of God. The goal of Christ's likeness is to be conformed to the image of Christ until we are in the presence of Christ. Fellowship with Christ then leads to a fellowship toward Christ. And that is why Paul says in verse 17, brothers, join in imitating me. I mean, what an incredible statement. If you're wanting to know what this looks like, Paul says, look at me. If you're wanting to understand the height and the depth of God's mercy and love and grace, know Christ and imitate me. Imitation is not just the sincerest form of flattery. Imitation is the most authentic form of Christianity. Paul affectionately commands God's people at Philippi to keep on mimicking me in one accord. Within the context of friendship and trust, Paul asked these congregants to imitate his speech, his conduct, his love, his faithfulness and purity. Paul here is not boasting, but rather with an urgent plea, is humbly asking God's people to imitate him in their attitudes and in their decisions and in their behavior as they together pursue perfection in Christ. It takes all of us. It takes each of us individually and corporately to say we must pursue Christ together, and it'll take every fiber in our being. The famous Irish missionary, Amy Carmichael, was right when she says, let us die climbing to be like Christ. It will take all of us striving and yearning as we continue to follow Christ. And God, by his grace, will give those in and amongst us who will be the example, who will help set the pace Help show the way. And Paul says in verse 17, we are to keep your eyes on those who walk. Fix your gaze on. Observe to apply is Paul's point in verse 17. People who impact the world influence others. Who are you influencing? For Christ. What impact are you seeing in and around your life? Paul says, keep your eyes on those who walk. 
It would have been describing Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus, those who the Philippians knew as overseers and deacons, men of faith who emulated Christ in and among his people. Now, I'll remind you, this is not a foreign concept in the New Testament. In fact, I was shocked by this. Did you realize that followers of Christ in the New Testament are commanded 134 separate times to imitate God, to imitate Christ, to imitate other believers? You see, the idea of imitation is drawing back from Paul's Jewish heritage. For as a pupil would be expected to learn from a rabbi, not just by receiving instruction, but by putting into practice in his life. In fact, did you realize that the Jews considered the rabbi's life as the living Torah? They were a living word of God in and amongst and before God's people. Which means then, that as we continue to do life, one of the most important decisions that you'll make for Christ is not just your salvation. It's not just a commitment to be more like Christ, but his friends as you walk with Christ. You show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. You show me who you are hanging around with, who you are listening to, who you are getting advice from, and I'll show you your future in Christ. Watch out for friendly fire. Oh, God taught me this this week. We had kind of a celebration among family who just happens to be friends in our family. It was a belated birthday celebration of myself and my oldest son, Major. And Major wanted to do airsoft. Have you heard of this? It's kind of like this new age paintball, but instead of you know, shooting paintballs at you, they, they shoot these little airsoft pellets. And they said, oh, it's just like a little bee sting. No, it's not. <laughs> it's like a bee sting with a firecracker attached all at once, all right? So we devise up in these teams, and this is my family here, and we're hanging out, and basically you have these games that you play. And so one of these games was, you know, kind of almost like capture the flag, and whoever has the most flags at the end of the game wins. Or we play this game called office space, and basically you have this briefcase, and you have one team that's defending the briefcase, don't let them have it, and then another team that's trying to get the briefcase, and if they run it all the way back, then they win. Well, on my team was my youngest son, Tate, who his call sign that day was Tiger Ninja, all right? And so Tate just turned five. This gun is bigger than he is, but he's having the time of his life. And so, you know, you begin to talk to him and, you know, Daddy, what's going to happen? I said, well, son, they're going to blow this whistle and you know, we're going to play this game and, you know, then, then people are going to start shooting at us. They're going to what? I said, yeah, you know, they're, they're going to shoot these little pellets and you just you never know how you're going to react until the bullets start flying and so Tate the moment he starts hearing these little airsoft pellets he holds on to me like a koala just jumps on my back and so I'm carrying around this kid and trying to run to and fro and so in running and with Tate getting so excited he shot me not once but twice <laughs> finally after the second time I was like bro you cannot shoot me. We're on the same team. Sorry. <laughs> Life can be like that sometimes. <coughs> Have you ever met somebody and you're like, this is awesome. We're going to be instant friends. We have all of these commonalities. We have all of these same passions. Man. And then just like that, they change. Just like that, they begin making decisions that don't honor the Lord. Just like that, they begin doing things that don't bring honor to the Lord, and they're wanting you to come with them. And then you have a choice now. I mean, if life truly is a culmination of decisions, what is my choice? Do I choose myself, or do I choose Christ? You see, Paul says that there were those in and amongst the church of Philippi that were living an example. They were standing firm. They were standing up when it matters. Keep your eyes on them. And as we go out and do life, he's going to give us an examples in verses 18 and 19 of don't follow these people. You and I have a choice. So what does a true friend in Christ look like? Can I tell you that the Bible says you can know? 
The Bible tells us about three things. Friends who help you know Christ, become like Christ, and do something for Christ. Oh, what a friend you have in Christ. I mean, if you have a friend that can help you know Christ better, they encourage you, they challenge you, they pray for you. They're, they're a text away. Hey, thinking about you, praying for you right now. Hey, just checking in. How are you? Hadn't seen you in a while. Hey, man, let's go eat some good food. Let's go hang out. I want to hear what's on your heart and what's on your mind. They help you know Christ. Oh, what a friend. They help you become like Christ. And they're, they're, they're not only just praying for you and encouraging you, they're holding you accountable. Hey, I, I've noticed you're, you've been really passionate about this lately. Tell me about that. Hey, you, know, you, you seem a little burdened or angered about this. Why? Why are you holding so tightly onto this? Or hey, I, I've noticed, man, you know, you're, you're just so celebratory lately. I mean, there's so much joy. Why? Because I'm becoming like Christ, that's why. Oh, what a friend. I think finally you can find someone to do something for Christ. I mean, to make an impact, to live a life of mission. They're not just praying, but man, they're doing. They're going out, they're making an impact. They're sharing the gospel, they're showing the gospel, they're living the gospel. If you can find just a handful of friends in your life that can do these three things, oh, the blessing that is yours in Christ. Paul says, keep your eyes on those who walk on those who live out what they truly believe according to the example you have in us. The best teaching of Scripture is best done by God's Word in our lives. We are not just to know Christ, but to live for Christ. And so Paul says, keep your eyes on us. Fix your gaze on us according to the example that you have seen. This word example here is powerful. It means what is stamped or marked or a pattern displayed through a lifestyle. Paul says, keep your eyes on us. Not in just what we are saying, but in what we are doing. So let me ask you this question then. How many people in our lives have never followed Christ because we've never given them the chance to follow us? I mean, how many people does God place in our lives that are desiring real advice, real counsel, what it looks like to have sustainable happiness and joy and peace and love? And God's placed us by them to show them. Paul says, according to the example you have in us. So what does it look like to live a life worth following? What does it look like to be an example? I think if Paul were here, he would summarize his entire theology in one statement. What does this look like for me? Not me, but he. I have found the greatest joys and trials in my life have all come to this conclusion that your entire life is a battle between two pronouns, me or he. Who is this about? Who is this for? Why am I pursuing this? Why do I love this? Why do I want to tell people about this? Why do I want to spend my money on these things? Is this about me or is this about Jesus? Remember what Paul says in Galatians 2.20? For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I believe in this verse. There are four examples that if you were to take and to live out, oh, the impact that you can make. Oh, the life that you would have worth following. You say, well, what does that look like? Number one, take a step of faith toward Christ. I mean, may the, may the aim of your life, and that's the end of your life, be for Christ. May the aim be obedience. God, whatever you're asking me to do, may I obey. May I have a posture and a disposition, not just of hearing, but of listening. 
of doing what it is you're asking me to do. And may that be seen through a lifestyle that actively takes a step. Lord, this walk, this journey, it's yours. But you trust me with this step. May you take a step of faith toward Christ. Ah, secondly, may you believe a promise from Christ. You know, it's amazing to me the disparity among theologians about how many promises are in the Bible. Are you aware of this? You know how many promises are in the Bible? 31,000 verses are in this book. How many promises? Did you realize that some theologians say there's up to 30,000 promises of God in the Bible? And to me, that seems a little high, but maybe. Most conservative commentators think, you ready for this? There are 8,810 promises in the Bible. Or, literally, 25 promises a day, approximately. So are we listening to the world? Are we trusting our feelings and emotions? Or are we believing the promise from Christ? Believe a promise from Christ. Live a life worth following. Thirdly, own the hardship with Christ. We're going to need these promises, are we not? I mean, every once in a while, a pandemic's going to come. The world's going to be turned upside down. Calamity is coming. May we be grounded in God's word. May we stand firm, stand up, own the hardship with Christ that he's entrusted us with. We are not alone in these obstacles. We are not in isolation with this hardship. No, Christ in and through us is there. Stand firm, own this assignment, or I assure you, it'll own you. Because Christ owns us, own the hardship. Now here's something interesting. You see this word example in verse 17, tupas. It means what is stamped or marked. This same word that Paul uses of us in Philippians 3, verse 17, was used by the disciples of the risen Christ in John 20, verse 25. Remember, the risen Christ comes to his disciples and they say, no, I'm not going to believe. Not until I see the mark of the nails in your arms. That's the same exact word Paul uses. The same word used to describe the risen Christ Paul uses of us. We have to trust whatever it is that God brings to us. It is good because it is going to make us more like Christ. Thus, it is worth it. Of course it's hard. Of course it's frustrating. Of course it doesn't seem fair. But it's exactly what God has for you. He's considering you worthy in this time to be everything that he's called you to be in Christ. Own the hardship with Christ and live a life worth following. Finally, embrace your future in Christ. Be of good cheer. Have joy because God is molding you, shaping you, maturing you to be everything he's called you to be. He's preparing you to be with him forever. And one day, all of this will make sense in Christ. Live a life worth following. Now, can I tell you as your pastor, I'm so humbled because so many of you are doing this. So many of you right now have been faithful through hardship, have been trusting in, in news that wasn't necessarily good, has shown courage and faith through this once in a century pandemic. Keep living a life worth following. Few do. Most don't. And that's why Paul says in verse 18 and 19, for many, shocked by this, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. For their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame. Why? Because their minds were set on earthly things. May it never be said of us. May you guard your mind with everything you've got. May you protect your heart. Make sure it is full of Christ. Because most don't. 
Do you see the burden here of Paul? He's overwhelmed in speaking of the church. He knows these people. And he knows that their ultimate destination is not in glory with Christ, but in torment in hell. And that is why he says here, tragically, I speak weeping. Did you realize in verse 18, this is the only reference in the New Testament that speaks of Paul himself crying in the present tense. He's overwhelmed. These people have so much potential. They have such great promise, but they are using the gospel for their own means. Christ is a means to their end. Though they've heard of the sweetness of Jesus, they're choosing to use Jesus for their own gain. The enemies mentioned here by Paul are deceptive. They're subtle. They're disguising themselves as followers of Christ. You would never even think these people would be this way, but they are. Their hearts are not for Christ, but for themselves. In 2015... There was a marathon runner that ran one of the fastest times in our country at that time. It was a woman who at the St. Louis Marathon ran this race so much so that she instantly qualified for the Boston Marathon just by how she finished this race. There was only one problem. She didn't actually run the race. She started the race but then disguised herself in and amongst the runners in the ultimate crowd, and then lost track of time and finished 45 minutes earlier than what she was supposed to. In doing so, she won the race, won $1,500, won a picture with Jackie Joyner Kersey, one of our most famous Olympians, and instantly qualified for one of the most famous races in the entire world, the Boston Marathon. But she didn't run the race. She had the appearance of running the race. And when they began to check her checkpoints, and they began to find that camera after camera couldn't find this woman, she was ultimately disqualified. She had the uniform, she had the number, she had the appearance of the runner, but yet she never run the race. Paul says, watch it. Be on guard. Keep your eyes on those who are living out this example because most won't. Not all relationships are profitable. Guard those who love themselves and not Christ. Run from any relationship that pulls you away from Christ. I realize as followers of Christ, we're within this divine tension of living out the gospel, of sharing the gospel, of showing the love of Christ. But yet the litmus test is, if they pull you away from Christ, be on guard, Paul says. Watch it. Because your heart is a very fickle thing. Your heart is something that must be owned completely by Christ. And for those who love Christ, oh, the riches that are available in Christ. But for those who follow themselves, that Christ is their means to their end. Paul says in verse 19, their end is destruction. Ultimate ruin. Ultimate spiritual destruction is Paul's point. He has here the concept of idolatry in verse 19. Did you realize this word destruction is mentioned 150 times in the Old Testament alone? It is the complete opposite of salvation. It's the complete opposite of what God desires for us. Yet God gives us the desires of our hearts. And when we choose other things to put our minds on earthly things, God gives us over to what we desire. Their inward selfish orientation is earthly, not heavenly. Their personal sensual lust and body desires take over by man-centered traditions. And thus their impulses in not in blessing, but in disaster. Can I tell you it's always been this way? Addiction issues are worship issues. The body gets what the heart desires every single time. So what are you desiring? 
What are you longing for? Paul says, know Christ. Pursue Christ as your goal in life and as your prize in life. And in pursuing Christ, God will be gracious to allow you to do that with others in his church. Keep your eyes on them. Live a godly example. If you do, most don't because their mind is on earthly things. And if the mind stays on earthly things, then the heart does not belong to Christ. Life is a culmination of our choices. The world offers us many things. May we be people of faith. May we be people who live a life that matters. May we be people who choose as Christ to know him as the goal and prize of life. And in following Christ, that sets an example, a trajectory that has the potential to impact others. May we take a step of faith toward Christ. May we believe a promise from Christ. May we own the hardship with Christ and embrace your future in Christ. Give your life to this one thing. Live a life worth following. Oh, the joy it is to be a part of a group of people who says, we'll do just that. Let's follow Christ. And may, may God's grace, may others follow us as we live a life worth following.